So just a couple things before we get started today. Uh, remember that we have uh, two non-instructional days this week, uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. Uh, because of that, there's no Biology 111 lab this week. Okay, so everybody should have had lab four last week, meaning that your, uh, if you're in my lab section, your lab report isn't due until Wednesday of next week, since we're off this week. Um, for, the, for those of you who don't have me as a lab instructor, of course, you know, listen to your own lab instructor as to for when your, uh, your lab report is due. Um, also, this means we'll be off Wednesday. So uh, after today, our next meeting will be Friday. So that's going to affect our quiz schedule as well. So because we don't have class on Wednesday, our, our usual quiz days, of course, are Wednesday and Friday. This week, because of the non-instructional days, we'll just have one quiz on Friday. All right, I think that's about it as far as announcements. So let's get back to chapter six. So when we left off of chapter six, we were talking about the light independent reactions of photosynthesis. So we should all know by now that there are two stages to photosynthesis. We have the light dependent reactions and the light independent reactions. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you what, just for the sake of repetition, to get this to sink in, let's go over the light, what happens in the light dependent reactions again. So we're making two important things for the light independent reactions with the light dependent reactions. So in the light dependent reactions, we're making ATP. Okay, that's gonna be an important source of energy in the light independent reactions. And we're also reducing NADP to NADPH. Okay, that's gonna be an important source of uh, protons and electrons for making glucose in the light independent reactions. Okay, so oops. So going back, uh, what happens in the light dependent reactions? Well, remember, the, in the light dependent reactions, we have two photosystems. We have photosystem two and photosystem one. Photosystem over two over here comes first, photosystem one comes second. So the light dependent reactions start when a photon of light is captured by the light harvesting complex of photosystem two. Okay, this uh, photon of light is gonna bounce back and forth between all of these chlorophyll molecules that make up the light harvesting complex of photosystem two until it encounters a specialized chlorophyll molecule that's called what? What do we call the specialized chlorophyll molecule? So we have P680 in photosystem two, P700 in photosystem one. What are these called? Reaction centers. Okay, so when that photon of light reaches the reaction center of photosystem two, which is P680, that's going to excite two electrons and uh, eject them into a higher energy state. So photosystem two needs to replace these two lost, lost electrons. How's it gonna do that? Well, it's gonna split a molecule of water into two protons, two electrons, and one half of an O2 molecule. The two electrons replace those, the two that were lost from photosystem two. The two protons can't cross this phospholipid bilayer, so they're gonna accumulate in the thylakoid compartment. Uh, one half of an O2 molecule is gonna combine with another one half of an O2 molecule that can cross the phospholipid bilayer. That's gonna diffuse out. All right, now the two lost electrons are gonna enter the electron transport chain of photosystem two. As the electron goes from component to component in the electron transport chain, it goes to lower and lower energy levels. Some of this energy is captured by the cell to do work. Specifically, the work being done is to pump a proton from the stroma into the thylakoid compartment. Okay, so again, building up that proton concentration gradient. Over here at photosystem one, so continuing, a photon of light is captured by the light harvesting complex of photosystem one. 
Again, it's going to bounce randomly between all these chlorophyll molecules until it encounters the reaction center of photosystem one, a molecule called P700. Again, two electrons are going to be uh, excited and enter a high energy state ejected from photosystem one. Uh, we need replacement electrons. This time, the replacement electrons are going to come from the electron transport chain of photosystem two. The two electrons that enter the high energy state are going to enter a shorter electron transport chain. At the end of this electron transport chain, um, two electrons plus two pro plus a proton plus NAD NADP is going to reduce this NADP to NADPH. Okay. And again, this is going to be important in the light independent reactions um, where it's going to be an important source of protons and electrons. Okay, so the whole time we've been doing this, we've been building up this concentration gradient inside the thylakoid compartment. And we know from earlier chapters that protons can't diffuse across a phospholipid bilayer. Okay? They need to go down uh, a pore forming channel. ATP synthase has a pore forming channel. So as protons diffuse down the concentration gradient, out of the thylakoid compartment into the stroma, some of the energy from these protons going down their concentration gradient is used to drive the formation of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, ATP, of course, is the energy currency of the cell. This is important because it's going to, it's going to provide energy for the light independent reactions. Okay, let's review the light independent reactions as well. So we can divide the light independent reactions into three stages, fixation of carbon dioxide, reduction of uh, PGA to PGAL, and regeneration of RUDP. So let's actually use this step. Okay, so this first step, this, uh, this uh, first part of this step slide shows you stage one. Okay, stage one is fixation of carbon dioxide. So we start with uh, uh, ribulose bisphosphate or RUBP. And how many carbons does RUBP have? Nobody remembers? You need to keep track of these carbons, right? So CO2, of course, has one carbon. Ribulose bisphosphate or, or RUBP has five carbons. So they join together to make a six carbon molecule, but the six carbon molecule is unstable. And it's almost immediately going to split into two three carbon phosphoglycerate or PGA. Okay, so just kind of ignore these numbers, the, the six and everything. So one car, I want you to remember the, the carbons and you can just count the, the black balls for carbons. One, so we have a one carbon CO2, five carbon ribulose bisphosphate. These join together, they make an unstable six carbon molecule that breaks into two PGA or phosphoglycerate. In the next step, we're going to reduce the PGA to PGAL. So we're going to use some of the energy from ATP, the ATP we got from the light dependent reactions, and we're going to use electrons and protons from the NADPH that we made in the light dependent reactions. And we're going to use that to reduce PGA to PGAL. Energy from ATP, electrons and protons from NADPH, and we reduce PGA to PGAL. Okay. Now there's two things we can do with PGAL. Does anybody remember one of them? So if we take two, three carbon PGAL, combine them together, what do we get? What's with that? Glucose, exactly. So we can take two PGAL and make glucose. Remember, one of the, well, the product of the light independent reactions is a phosphorylated glucose. And that's what we get when we put two PGAL together we make a phosphorylated glucose, which is just a, a glucose with a phosphate functional group attached. Okay, so that's great. I mean, that's what we want to do. We want to make PGAL. 
but we can't use up all of our PGAL making glucose. Why is that? Remember that the light independent reaction is a cycle. So how do we, how do we complete a cycle? Anybody remember? So remember to complete the cycle, we need to regenerate this five carbon ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, so we're gonna take some PGAL, use that to make phosphorylated glucose, and then we're gonna take some other of that PGAL plus energy from ATP and use that to regenerate the five carbon RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, this completes the cycle, and now that ribulose bisphosphate will go back in the cycle again. Okay, so we're gonna take some of this PGAL, so two PGAL will make a phosphorylated glucose. We can then use that phosphorylated glucose to make other things like cellulose or starch. Then we're going to take the rest of that PGAL plus the energy from ATP and regenerate that five carbon ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, again, RUBP is fine. You guys, if you guys just know the abbreviations, that's fine. So we're gonna use the rest of that PGAL to regenerate the RUBP, and that goes back into the cycle and we keep going around and around. All right. Okay, so again, guys, I know this is more difficult stuff. This is probably the hardest chapter you're gonna do all semester, um, but if you just keep at it, like I said, repetition is gonna help this to, to sink in. All right, so the light independent re reaction we looked at is just one type of light independent reaction. There's actually three types of light independent reactions. So we have three pathways for light independent reactions. Plants have pores called stomata in the bottom sides of their leaves to let CO2 in and to expel O2. Plants also lose water that it needs for photosynthesis through stomata, particularly in dry, hot climates. Okay, let's go over to the whiteboard. section of a leaf. So we have an epithelial layer of cells. On the outside, on the underside of the leaf, we have another epithelial layer of cells, but there's these pores every, every so often. Okay, then in the, in the interior of the cell, there is this loose aggregation of cells called mesophyll. Okay, you don't need to know that right now. All right. Now, we know that we need CO2 to do the light independent reactions, right? The CO2 for photosynthesis comes from the air. So that's why we have, so these are the stomata here and here. And the stomata are pores in the underside of the leaf that allow air in. So CO2 can diffuse in from the atmosphere. Again, this is important because CO2 is our source of carbon and oxygen for making glucose in the light independent reaction. Also from the light dependent reactions. Remember when we're splitting molecules of water to replace electrons in photosystem two, one of the byproducts is oxygen, O2. We need a way for oxygen to get out. So the stomata allow carbon dioxide in, they allow oxygen out. But one bad thing is we also need water to do photosynthesis. Water vapor 
can also diffuse out. Now, this isn't really a problem for plants that don't live in hot, dry climates, but for plants that live in hot, dry climates, losing water through the stomata can be a real problem. So that's why three different uh, types of light independent reactions have evolved. Okay? Plants that are in hotter, drier climates need another type of, of uh, light independent reaction so that they don't lose too much water through their stomata. Okay, the first type of light independent reaction is the C3 pathway. And this is the one that we talked about. So when I showed you the, the three different stages of light independent reactions, I was showing you the three different stages for the C3 pathway. The C3 pathway needs a continuous supply of CO2. CO2 can't be fixed in these plants for long. So uh, the reason this is called the C3 pathway is because the first molecule after carbon fixation is a three carbon molecule, okay, PGA, phosphoglycerate. So remember we take one carbon, carbon dioxide, five carbon RUVP, make a six carbon molecule that breaks into two, three carbon PGA. That's why we call that the, the, the three, the C3 pathway, three carbon PGAs. We can't fix carbon as three carbon PGAs for long. Okay, so that means in order to do photosynthesis, there has to be a continuous supply of CO2. This means that the stomata or the pores in the bottom of the leaves have to remain open all the time. The end product in the C3 pathway is a phosphorylated glucose. Okay, so again, remember once we, once we reduce the PGA to PGAL, we can use two of those PGAL to make a phosphorylated glucose. Or, and we have to use some of that PGAL also to, to regenerate the ribulosmus phosphate. Um, once we turn PGAL into glucose, uh, we can then use that glucose to make starch or cellulose or, or disaccharides or whatever else we need, uh, you know, building blocks of poly polysaccharides for. Okay? So this works fine as long as you're not in a hot, dry environment. As long as so stomata have to remain open for CO2, you're going to lose some water as water vapor but if you're not in a hot, dry climate, it's not going to be a real problem. So what about plants that do live in hot, dry environments? I'll just give you a second. I see some people still taking notes. I'll give you just a second to finish up. So what about plants that don't live in moist environments? What, what about plants that live in hot, dry environments? Well, they have what's called a, a C4 pathway. So in the C4 pathway, the first carbon dioxide acceptor is a four carbon molecule. Okay, so in other words, it's called the C4 pathway because carbon is fixed as a four carbon molecule rather than a three carbon PGA. The four carbon molecule can store CO2 for a short time. This means that stomata can close for some part of the day to reduce water loss. Um, the end product of this pathway is also PGAL. 
So again, we can use PGAL to make glucose, make a phosphorylated glucose, and then use the phosphorylated glucose to make starch, cellulose, disaccharides, whatever. Okay, so let me give you an example of this. So I'm trying to think the last time we had a hot, dry summer. The last couple summers were kind of wet. But what happens to your lawn when you have a, when there's a hot, dry summer? Yeah, the grass turns brown, right? I remember when I lived in California, uh, every summer, was, of course, it's much drier there. Every summer, the, the grass, you didn't see green grass from, from May until October, right? So the reason that the grass turns brown is because most of the nice kind, kinds of lawn varieties of grass, like Kentucky bluegrass, are sea tree plants. So when it gets hot and dry in the summer, they lose too much water through their stomata because they can't close them, and that's why it turns brown. But what happens if in your lawn you have some crabgrass along with your, your nice bluegrass? Does the crabgrass turn brown too? No. The crabgrass doesn't, the crabgrass does just fine when it's hot and dry in the summer. The reason for that, crabgrass is a C4 plant. Okay, so during the hot, dry parts of the day, the crabgrass can close its stomata. This will prevent water loss. And then during the evening when it cools off, it can open the stomata again and so that it doesn't have to use the stored carbon anymore. And it can, it can start fixing carbon again. Okay? So a C4 plant like crabgrass can survive better when it's hot and dry than a C3 plant like, like the, the regular varieties of grass that we plant for our lawns. Okay, then if we go to like more extreme hot dry environments, like a desert environment, uh, these types of plants use a very different uh, method to make PGAL called the CAM pathway. With the CAM pathway, uh, CO2 can be stored all night long. Okay, so this, this allows the plant to, to close its stomata all day, basically. Water levels are higher. Okay, this is important uh, for plants that live in the desert. Um, I don't know if you guys ever had like a, uh, like a, a potted succulents, like potted cactus or a, a potted aloe plant, but uh, of course they're, they have a lot of water in them. Um, this is important because that water can help to normalize their temperature. So you guys probably know that although deserts are very hot during the day, they get very cold at night, right? So when a plant has a lot of water, a high water content like a cactus, during the day, the sun is gonna heat up the water inside the cactus and the water is gonna hold the heat very well. Then when it gets very cold at night, but the, the heat still held in that water helps to keep that plant warm during the night hours. Okay, then as it cools off in the morning, it's gonna help, it's gonna absorb heat and help to keep it cool during the daylight hours as well. Okay, so we have much higher water content. We have much less water loss because we don't have to uh, open the stomata when it's hot and dry and we might lose water. And again, a good example of this is uh, any type of a succulent plant, like a, a cactus plant is a good example, uh, yucca plants, uh, aloe plants, um, any type of a succulent. All right, so the last couple slides that we're going to go over in this chapter um, are going to have to do with the relationship between photosynthesis and aerobic respiration. And to talk about this, we have to go way back to the formation of life on this planet. So if we look way back in the early, early prehistory of the Earth, originally there was no molecular oxygen in the early Earth's atmosphere. Okay, that didn't come till much later. 
Biomolecules, so things like proteins, phospholipids, et cetera, were able to form, to form spontaneously, uh, which eventually, again, we're talking about a huge time frame here, millions of years. Over millions of years, these spontaneously formed uh, biomolecules led to living organisms. Some of these living organisms evolved the ability to uh, capture the energy from the sun. Uh, this led to photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis, so we know one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is O2, right? So when we split water molecules in order to replace electrons and build up that concentration gradient of protons, one of the byproducts is oxygen. So eventually, again, we're talking about huge spans of time here over millions of years of, of uh, organisms doing photosynthesis, oxygen began to accumulate in the atmosphere. All right. Now, of course, we think of oxygen as a good thing because we need it to survive. But in terms of chemistry, oxygen is a very sort of reactive and corrosive molecule. Once oxygen built up to a certain level, biomolecules weren't able to spontaneously form anymore, okay? Because oxygen is very reactive. So it's gonna, re it's gonna react with these, uh, the precursors for these biological molecules and prevent the biological molecules from forming, okay? This is called oxidation. Um, let me go back to the board. This isn't something you need to know for the test but just maybe to help you understand a little better. So oxygen can form things called uh, reactive oxygen species or ROS. Some examples of reactive oxygen species, uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, we have uh, superoxide anion. And we have hydroxyl radicals, or hydroxy radicals, rather. Okay, these are very reactive and can damage biological molecules. And these can damage your tissues as well. Um, these can build up in your tissues. They can damage your DNA. Uh, they can da damage other biological molecules. How, how can we combat these in our bodies? Uh, one way is by antioxidants. Uh, antioxidants are things like, uh, a good example is vitamin C. Ascorbic acid is an antioxidant. It'll neutralize um, reactive oxygen species like these and prevent them from damaging your tissues. Okay, so this is why um, if you watch any TV at all, you're probably familiar with commercials touting antioxidants, like green tea, full of antioxidants, it's good for you. Uh, pomegranate juice, it's full of antioxidants, it's good for you. The, the reason that they're, they're pushing these things is because they neutralize these reactive oxygen species, uh, which can damage lots of biology. They, they can damage your DNA, they can damage proteins, any biological molecules, basically. Okay? Stuff like this is why biological molecules couldn't form, form spontaneously once the oxygen built up to a certain level in the atmosphere. Okay? Stuff like this would prevent 
biological molecules from forming. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, O2 is extremely reactive, forms free radicals that damage tissue, breaks apart organic molecules. Okay, and it's basically the reactive oxygen species that I put on the board that's a bit that's responsible for that. Organisms evolve the mechanism to neutralize O2 by adding protons and turning it into water. Eventually, bacteria evolve the metabolic pathway to strip protons from organic molecules, carbohydrates, and fatty acids. This released energy that can be turned into ATP. Okay? So the organisms that don't do photosynthesis had to develop a way to neutralize this toxic oxygen in the environment. All right, and it just so happened the way that it evolved to do this was to strip protons away from biological molecules, use those protons to neutralize oxygen by turning it into water. And as it turned out, by, by metabolizing these, uh, these organic molecules, these biological molecules in this way, they got a whole lot more ATP from metabolizing in that way. All right, again, I see some people still taking notes, so I'll just give you a second to finish that up before we move on. Okay, so this method that was evolved to neutralize the oxygen, uh, O2 accepts protons at the end of this process, making water, making water detoxifies the oxygen. Later, this bacteria becomes an endosymbiote in eukaryotic cells that later become mitochondria. Mitochondria use molecular oxygen to extract 36 ATP out of one molecule of glucose compared to two ATP, okay? So basically what these last couple of slides are saying is aerobic respiration evolved in order to neutralize the toxic oxygen that was put out by the photosynthetic organisms, okay? And as, as it happens by, uh, through aerobic respiration, we can extract a whole lot more energy out of the, the molecules that we metabolize. Okay, 36 ATP for glucose by aerobic respiration, as opposed to only two ATP for glucose under anaerobic conditions or conditions in the lack of oxygen. So basically, uh, aerobic respiration is photosynthesis in reverse. Um, if we, we look at the, uh, the reactants in photosynthesis, uh, 12 water plus six CO2 plus the energy from sunlight gives us glucose plus oxygen plus six H2O. If we look at the net reaction for aerobic respiration, we take one glucose, plus 6O2 plus 6H2O, we get energy out in the form of ATP, and the products are 12H2O and 6CO2, okay? 
So they're, they're, they're the same reaction in reverse. In fact, photosynthesis and aerobic respiration are linked. Okay, so photosynthesis gives us oxygen to breathe. It gives us CO2 to use as a fuel source. Um, when we metabolize glucose in the presence of oxygen, we get water and uh, CO2. Of course, the CO2 then the plants can use to do photosynthesis. So the, the, the two reactions are, are linked. So plants use photosynthesis to make ATP when the sunlight is shining. In the dark and in the winter, in plants that drop their leaves, they use the glucose they make to get ATP through aerobic respiration. Okay, remember when we looked at plant cells and animal cells, animal cells have mitochondria, and they, but they lack chloroplasts, right? So, so animal cells can't do photosynthesis. We look at plant cells, Plant cells have chloroplasts, but they still have mitochondria too. So this means that they can make their own food from sunlight when the sun is shining, uh, when the sun's not shining, or it's the winter when they drop their leaves. So they, they can't do photosynthesis without leaves. They can use the energy that they have stored as starch to keep doing metabolism. So they do metabolism by aerobic respiration in the winter, right now before the leaves are on the trees. They're all surviving by doing aerobic respiration. Once it gets warmer and they sprout leaves, they'll start getting their energy from photosynthesis. Animals, most fungi and most protista, use their organic molecules made by plants, use the organic molecules made by plants and other photosynthetic eukaryotes to fuel aerobic respiration. Okay, so in other words, animals, protista, fungi are either consumers or in the case of, of fungi decomposers, right? So we're gonna use the food that's made by the producers and burn that in the presence of oxygen, mostly, most, most living things, uh, for energy. All right, so that takes us to the end of chapter six. Um, you guys have any questions on chapter six? Anything I covered today or anything at all in chapter six you'd like to ask about before we start chapter seven? Okay, so like I said, chapter seven, chapter six, that's, that's I think without a doubt the, the hardest chapter that we're gonna cover this semester. Um, chapter seven is still challenging, but not quite as bad. So in the, about 10, 12 minutes remaining, let's get a start on chapter seven. Okay, so in chapter seven, we're gonna talk about aerobic respiration. So the word aerobic means in the presence of oxygen. The aerobic in the presence of oxygen. On the other hand, anaerobic means in the absence of oxygen. So when I talk about aerobic respiration, respiration in the presence of oxygen, if I when I talk about anaerobic respiration later, that's respiration in the absence of O2, molecular oxygen. This is the main pathway of ATP formation in living things. So uh, almost all living things use aerobic respiration to make energy. Carried out by all plants, all animals, uh, many fungi, many protestins, many bacteria. Okay? Again, there are exceptions, but it's pretty ubiquitous, you know, pretty widespread amongst almost all living things. The net reaction for aerobic respiration, uh, C6H12O6, which is glucose plus oxygen, 
gives us CO2, carbon dioxide, and water. And we should probably add in here, we get energy out in the form of ATP. Okay, very important. So glucose plus oxygen gives us energy in the form of ATP plus CO2 plus water. Okay, aerobic respiration, we can break down into basically three stages. Okay, you'll see why I say basically three in a little bit. Um, first stage is glycolysis. Okay, glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. Second stage is the Krebs cycle. This takes place in the mitochondria. And the third stage is the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, this also takes place in the mitochondria. Okay. The reason I say uh, basically three, um, there is an intermediate step between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Um, sometimes I like to call this stage 1A. Okay. And this is called uh, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex or PDHC. Oh no, I thought it was going to get away with that. Not, not, it's not happening. I, this doesn't happen in any other computer except this one. Oh yeah, what a mess. Okay. Um, obviously, I can't write it now, but uh, PDHC takes place in the, um, oops, PDHC takes place in the mitochondria as well. Okay, so you can kind of like, Stick step 1A in here. That's PDHC, as in pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, takes place in the mitochondria. And as I mentioned at the end of the last PowerPoint presentation, is that aerobic respiration and photosynthesis are linked. So you can see the products of aerobic respiration are the reactants for photosynthesis. And the products of photosynthesis are the reactants for aerobic respiration. So these two reactions are, are linked. So let me move this out of the way. So we get, again, remember like when we talk about metabolism in chapter five, the flow of energy is from the sun through the producers, then to the consumers and the decomposers. So in photosynthesis, the, we, we use CO2 and H2O plus the energy from sunlight to make glucose and oxygen. The consumers and the decomposers use the glucose and the oxygen to make energy in the form of ATP. And the products of that are CO2 and H2O, okay, which in turn can be used in photosynthesis plus the energy from sunlight to make glucose and oxygen, et cetera. So the, the two reactions are linked and we kind of get this one way flow of, of energy from the sun through the consumers, uh, pardon me, through the producers, then the consumers and the decomposers.
All right, this looks like a good place to stop, even though it's, we have five minutes left. I did see some people here um, who haven't gotten their test back yet. And I forgot to, to make that announcement at the beginning. Um, if you haven't gotten your test back yet in your class today, see me after class. Um, you know, it is important to have these tests so that you can study for the file from them. Um, let me just repeat the uh, announcements I made at the beginning. So remember that um, this week we're off Tuesday and Wednesday. That means no lab this week, uh, no Wednesday lecture, and we only have one quiz that's going to be this coming Friday. Okay. So again, uh, enjoy your little break. Um, again, if you didn't get your test back, see me after class. And um, if there's no questions from anybody on Zoom, I'm going to end the meeting here and I'll see you guys again on Friday. You need your exam? Let me just stop the. Uh, uh, not a problem. Um, and your name? Uh, Chris Gregg.